this is a new verse in the Bible that's not in the King James, it's not in the Hebrew, so where did this come from? Why is the NRSV and others adding this verse into the Tanakh? Shalom and welcome to Hebrew Voices. This is Nehemia Gordon and I'm here once again with Rabbi Dr. David Moster and we are going to be discussing the difference between the Bible in English and the Bible in Hebrew. Shalom, Rabbi, Dr. David Moster. It's great to have you on the program. Yeah, thank you. I think this is our fourth time together. Fourth and time, and, and I want to encourage people to go back and watch the other episodes. We did an episode called Chinese Origin, Chinese, <laughs> Chinese Origin of the Sukkot Etrog, Toilets in Ancient Israel, and the Mishnah in the New Testament, which just from that, it, it shows that you have quite a, an eclectic array of things that you teach about. You have the uh, Institute of Biblical Culture, you have a YouTube channel called Biblical Culture, and your website is biblicalculture.org. And you told me something which I was really excited about, that you're actually going to start doing a course where you teach people biblical Hebrew. I get people all the time who ask me, where can I study biblical Hebrew? You know, I actually, I don't know if you know this, I taught uh, biblical Hebrew to a Christian pastor and later taught it to a, a well-known football player, Reggie White. And so people come to me all the time and say, we heard you taught Reggie White Hebrew, would you teach us Hebrew? And I'll be honest, right now, I don't have time to do it. But you've made time out of your day and out of your week to do it. What a blessing to people. I want to give the, your background so they understand what a, what, what a big deal this is to come study Hebrew from you. You have an ordination, meaning smicha, rabbinical ordination from Yeshiva University. You have uh, three master, uh, yeah, is it three master's degrees? I only have one master's degree. Uh albeit it's from Hebrew University, but you have an MA in Jewish education from Yeshiva University. You have an MA in Biblical Studies or Tanakh from uh, Yeshiva University. And you have another master's degree from NYU, New York University in Ancient Israel. You also have a bachelor's in Jewish philosophy from Yeshiva University. And, and maybe most important of all is you, uh, from my perspective, uh, is you have a PhD. Uh, uh, you actually have a doctorate from bar Ilan University in Biblical Studies. So that's, that's that's quite the quite the uh, education you have there. So I think you really do have the um, ability to teach people biblical Hebrew, or, or certainly the background. Why do you want to teach people biblical Hebrew? Tell us about that. So, so this is the excellent question: is what is the difference between studying the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the Tanakh in Hebrew? What is the difference between studying this in Hebrew and reading your translation in English, no matter what translation it is? So there's a group called Academic Biblical on Reddit. And what I asked okay. here was a question. And it said, if you read biblical Hebrew, what is something you notice or appreciate that gets lost in translation? Okay. What's something that, you, that gets lost, you know, between the Hebrew language and the English language? Okay. 175 people upvoted it. Wow. And we got a lot tell of cool tell us what upvoted mean. By the way, I see that, the first thing I saw was an ad for a... Uh, uh, for somebody do, doing something on Mother's Day, and I just realized. Yeah, yeah, we have to. This is not. I, I just realized that's an ad that has nothing to do with your question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and so an upvote Nehemiah is basically like a like on any okay. platform. So, okay. so it means 175 people thought this was pretty cool, and there was yeah. a nice debate with about like 100 comments about wow. this question, which is our question. So what I'd like to do is basically mm. go through some of these answers, um, yeah. and at the end maybe. Maybe today, maybe in another day for a different mm -hmm. session. What I'd also like to do is add my own. So let's get started. Okay. Okay. The most popular um, comment came from someone named Testate Amoeba. Okay. <laughs> and Testate Amoeba said, Is that the real name or that's just a screen name? That's it. You don't use your real name all. You use okay. kind of your like your makeup name. Um, okay. And what, what we have here is he pointed to this verse. It's Genesis 32, 25. In okay. this story, Jacob, in Hebrew, Yaakov, is fleeing from his brother Esau. Esau. Um, it's not entirely clear what's going to happen. And then he was crossing his family over the Jabbok River, in Hebrew, the Yabok. And then there's this weird phrase, which I'll read, I'll read out loud. It says, Vayivater Yaakov livado. And Jacob was left all by himself on the other side of the Jabbok River. By ye avek ish imo, and a man avaked with him. And this phrase is really odd. We're not entirely sure what it means. It, it might come from the word dust. So we think it's like someone wrestled him. And this was like the angel of God wrestling Jacob um, until the morning came and eventually Jacob would be renamed Israel. And, and the connection to dust is when you wrestle someone, 
you end up rolling around in the dust. Right. So what this Redditor pointed out is that there's this really odd phrase here of Valle Avec and this root, which Nehemi, you kind of mentioned dusting and wrestling, and I'll mm. make it a nice highlight here so everyone can see it. Um, mm. that, that word is very odd. It's not a normal ver word. It doesn't appear often. It's just a very odd thing. So what the reader pointed out was that it's a pun. And it's basically and Jacob, something like Jacob jabbed at the Jabbok, right? And so what you basically have is this pun, this idea that like, oh, we're using special language to kind of mirror the story going on is something that gets completely lost in the, in the English. So for example, here we have the uh, King James version um, and Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Right. Mm -hmm. It's kind of plain. It's not like the thrill of Manila or, you know, like Hakim the dream, something like that. You don't get these kind of these kind of puns in the English. But in the Hebrew, you get something more like Jacob jabbed at the Jabbok, something like that. Well, and, and, and if nothing else, you can say a book is there's a what we call Midrash, uh, a name derivation here that Yabok is being tied into the place of wrestling. Right? There you at, go. At, you yeah. Know, at the very least. And, and the example I love of that is the story of Gideon. Where Gidon is the verb, or the root of that is the verb in Deuteronomy, where it's used to cut down an Asheratri. That's the, the sacred pole of the pagans, of the Canaanites. And what does Gidon do? Is he cuts down the Asheratri, right? And and so it's in the it's like woven into the very fabric of the story, the, the these word puns. And here is an example where it's woven, and I didn't even notice this one. So it's woven into the fabric of the story. Certainly, Yavik and, and Yabok is is a uh, there's a word pun there. That's nice. Beautiful. Yeah, and this yeah. is this is actually in Genesis, Bereshit. Mm -hmm. And what I tried to do for the, the viewers is bring a lot from Genesis because mm -hmm. many people who start Hebrew start with Genesis. Okay. And the, the thing is, is that it's all over this book. So, for example, the name of Adam is also the name of man. Like mankind is Adam. Adam oh. is Adam, man. And we read in um, Genesis 2-7 mm -hmm. that... God created the man, Vayitzar Adonai Elohim et Adam afar min ha'adama, that God created the Adam, the man, dust from the Adama, the earth, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a clear pun in English, in Hebrew, that the name man, Adam, comes from the earth, Adama. So we have these word puns all over, and, and people who have heard me teach on uh, um, for years have heard of. Now, I've actually brought that example many, many times. I never brought the Yavok and Yavik example. I never noticed that. It's great. There, there was a professor actually at your alma mater, uh, bar Ilan University, Moshe Garciel, who wrote uh, really a groundbreaking book um, called, uh, what was it called? It was called Biblical Names. That's what it was called. And he shows many examples. He didn't come up with this idea, but he showed how it was not just uh, an individual the individual word puns and individual verses, but that it was woven into the very fabric of the story. And the great thing is that when you learn biblical Hebrew, it's all these names don't reveal themselves to you at once. As you learn more and more biblical Hebrew, you start noticing more and more and more. Like for example, still in Genesis, it took me a while to realize that the name of the first person who was killed, whose life was mm -hmm. cut short, mm -hmm. is Abel or Hevel in right. Hebrew. Right? right. And Hevel, as we know from the book of Kohelet, Ecclesiastes means, it can mean lots of things, but one of the things it means is cut short, like a breath in the wind, right? Like a breath. Or it means emptiness, uh, vanity, emptiness. That's all these different yeah. things, but that's what yeah. happened to Abel. His life was empty and cut off and short, yeah. right? So you kind of see these. And when I say that, like it takes time, it, was, it wasn't until last year that I actually heard um, an idea, maybe, maybe you've heard this. Um, yeah. But so the name Shimshon, uh -huh. right? What, what's the derivation of, of Shimshon? Sun, Shemesh. Right, the, the Shemesh is the sun, right? Right. And so who does he fall for? He falls for Delilah. Uh -huh. And Delilah convinces him at night, right? Mm -hmm. And what is in the name Delilah? Lila. I, Lila, night. Yes. Okay. Do so you have that Shimshon? Was, that, that Okay, that, that, that's interesting. What, what's I mean, what jumps out of that more for me is is the geography. He it, he takes place between Saran and Eshtaol, and what's exactly in the spot where he's uh, 
his story takes place, Beit Shemesh, which is a place where people worship the sun originally. Right, the, right? the house so, of the sun. Right, house of the sun, uh, temple of the sun. And here you got a guy named Shimshon, who um, he's kind of a sketchy character in some ways, right? Yep. He's worshiping the true God, but it, he's like, you know, doing all kinds of things like this is our hero who, who's called actually a savior, a savior of Israel who's going to prostitutes and he's having trouble with, you know, all kinds of women. And, and, and so there is some connection, a uh, subtle implication there that, that maybe he's not put completely in the camp of God. Maybe he's in the camp of sun worship or maybe the people around him are. And, right. and Delilah from Lila, that's interesting. I hadn't noticed that. I always took that to be a, a Philistine name and therefore probably not related to Hebrew. Although I guess we don't know for sure what the Philistines spoke. One of the early Philistine inscriptions we have actually is in Hebrew. So what are we so, going to do but about that? It doesn't yeah. matter if we know for sure. We'll never know for sure. But if you know mm -hmm. the Hebrew, you can now look for these types of puns and connections, mm -hmm. especially with names. And, and like, I'll, I'll just give one more example. The verb tzachak, to laugh. Yeah. appears 13 times in the Tanakh. Okay. 11 in them are in Genesis, most okay. having to do with one person. Isaac. Isaac, because yeah. Isaac in Hebrew is yeah. Yitzchak. He will laugh. So right. Abraham, at that time was Abraham, Avram, and Sarai, Sarah, they were laughing about this idea of having a kid in old age. And mm -hmm. then even Yitzchak himself makes Rebecca, Rivka laugh, right? So there's all this laughing around this, person isaac that if you're reading in the english you just have no idea that that's part of the text okay mm -hmm. all right so, so, let's so what, you're, what you're telling me is uh let's summarize the question was why do you want to teach hebrew and you're saying that you can convey to people that there is this um uh, a level of reading in hebrew a level in the story uh that's completely missed in translation and sometimes they try to convey it but usually it's it's very difficult to translate a pun Right. And so, so that sometimes they'll use a word that does sound similar. I've seen that, but 98% of the time they can't do it. And, and so that's lost. And, and that's a, a kind of a level of understanding that people can't have unless they see the original. Exactly. If you ask somebody, why did, why did Jacob, why did the King James use this word to wrestle with Jacob? Right. Yeah. There's no reason. It was just a good translation. But yeah. when it comes to say for Sheet, the book of Genesis, it, it's a good chance it was used to kind right. of tie everything together in this story. So, so, so here I want to bring up something which I've noticed in, in my own research, I've shared this with people, is that there's two, these uh, two types of name derivations. There, well, I guess Garcia talks about it as well. So there's the name derivations uh, that are explicit, right? And it says, and therefore he called her, uh, or therefore right. she was called Chava because she was the mother of all that Chayav, all that lived. Right. Or exactly. able to all that live. So that's an explicit name derivation. We also have ones that I call implicit. And an example of the implicit you brought. It doesn't say God made Adam out of the Adama, and therefore he was called Adam. But right. that's implied by the by the use of the language. And right. the example of Jacob, Vayav, and he uh, entered into the dust, right? It's the Nifa, which is sometimes has the meaning of to enter into something, into a, a dual relationship. He entered into the dust with him as related to the word yabok, uh, and that's an implicit name derivation. Sometimes you have both, which is the ones I love. So why is Esav's, Esav's descendants called Edom? Right. Well, we're, we're told explicitly because he sold his birthright for the red lentil soup. But yeah. then why tell us that when he came out, he was Admoni, he was all red? It's both. Right? right? So it's both, and one is explicit, one's implicit. Um, maybe you could say this is an example of polysemy. Meaning that that there there's there could be more than one reason for something, more than one truth about why something is something in the Tanakh. Uh, you know, in our Western thought, there's two plus two equals four. Well, it's true that two plus two equals four. In 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 um, I guess in spiritual matters, you could say, well, there could be multiple reasons for for something, right? Why do we keep the Shabbat according to Exodus and Deuteronomy and, and the Ten Commandments? One is because God created the world, and we rest He rested on the seventh day, and the other reason is because God took us out of Egypt and uh, we should have our servants rest just like we wanted to rest. And both are true, right? They're, 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 they're not contradictory. They're both true. So, yes. yeah. Yeah. So all you're, of, you're, yeah. yeah all, of, all of these can get lost. 
not necessarily yeah. like you point out some they point out but sometimes if it's not pointed out explicitly the even, english doesn't yeah. pick up on even it even when it's pointed out it's completely confusing <laughs> you read you know he was he was called such and such or you know and, and you know or it says something and therefore he was called such and such and you're like what on earth right, right? like I, moses I, I, from the right, waters or, I, or, I dragged or, him out or right? my favorite example for for those who are looking from a new testament perspective is um you know, the angel says he will save his people from his sins, from their sins or something, and therefore he will be called Jesus. What? <laughs> What's the connection? But every person reading in Hebrew knows that the name Jesus comes from Yeshua, which is for, for Yehoshua. And what does Yehoshua mean, Rabbi Dr. David Moster? So uh, the idea of salvation, God will save, God has saved, mm. or Yeshua by itself would be more of has been saved. Well, I mean, I understand Yeshua because Yeshua appears in uh, the book of Nehemiah as a short form of the name Yehoshua, right? It says in the book of Nehemiah, Yeshua bin Nun. And then there's a high priest in Ezra, I believe it's in Ezra, who's called Yeshua ben Yotzadak, and in Zechariah it's called Yehoshua ben Yehoshadak. So Yeshua is, from my right. perspective, just Same. short for Yehoshua. And what does Yehoshua mean? Well, how would you break it down? Give us the breakdown of Yehoshua. Well, so it's a, uh, it, it would be a, uh a hypocristicon, which is a fancy word of saying that it's a sentence that becomes a name. And so Ooh, I like that word hypocristicon. Okay. Yeah, it's only in biblical studies because Semitic uh -huh. languages do this. You know, other other languages don't do this. Um, and so the, the idea is and Nehemiah, I know you have a lot on this. So I'll yeah. just kind of set up. But I want them to hear it from someone who was raised Orthodox. Well, I was raised Orthodox too. But I don't have well, I don't have ordination from YU. Uh, right. Rabbi Dr. David Moster, tell and, so, I, so they, I, and the term hypocristicon, it's a, it's a good term. I haven't used that. I mean, I know they talk about theophoric names, right? Yes, uh, and, yes. And you do have theophoric names in other languages. A theophoric name is where you, you give devotion to uh, a deity in a name. So like Martin means a servant of Mars. And they say Christopher is a servant of Christ, right? So, right. Uh, and look, we have this in, in, in Canaanite languages, like in Punic. Which is a sister language of Hebrew. We have Hannibal, which is Chani Baal, which is the same as uh, Hananiahu, Hananiah, except with instead of Yahu, it's Baal, right? So it's beloved of Baal, or Baal has grace, or something like that. So these are hypocristicons, and, and what is the hypocristicon of Yeshua? Well, so you have the name Yah. It mm -hmm. might also be these two might have been elided, so it could have been Yaho, that mm -hmm. could have been part of it, and then the Vav could also be. The, the yud for yesha is to save so mm -hmm. from that what you want to do is to try and make a sentence out of those mm -hmm. two words they don't have to be perfect it's not like a normal sentence so you could think mm -hmm. that god has saved god will saved you can even mm -hmm. say god save exclamation point something like that mm -hmm. is that is that how you understand it Nehemiah? yeah i mean I, I would understand it as um uh, first of all yes but I would understand it maybe more maybe more specific so you're right you're right here's where it's 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 easier to do it when the verb is in the beginning and you have the yud as the he will, then it's much easier to know that it's it's the um, imperfect, that there's this, you know, maybe repeated action or however you understand the imperfect, right? Uh, when when it's uh, the other way around, it's a little bit more difficult. Is it past? Is it present? Uh, maybe it's maybe it's a combination of the different forms. Um, so you're right. In other words, Yishayahu, which is essentially the same name as Yehoshua. Right. Yishayahu, we can say more, more um, confidently means uh, Yudhe Bavhe will save, right? Exactly. Um, uh, but even the there, the, even there, the root is part of the Yud is part of the root. So maybe it's a bit complicated. But I'm like my name Nehemiah. You would say is past tense. Yah has comforted, right? Otherwise, it would have been Yenachemiah or something like that, presumably. But you're right. They're not. They're not normal sentences, and it's kind of a mistake to treat them as normal sentences. Um, and then sometimes it's not. It's not always. I sometimes the, the function within this hypocristicon of, of the name of the deity isn't always the same, right? Like aviad means uh, eternal father, right? Uh, so there's not even a verb, uh, ad, right? It's, it's um, I'm not sure it would be an adverb there, uh, you know? Uh, so, so you have the root, the verbal root, uh, or some kind of a root, or some kind of a word combined with, with the name of a deity, and, and their relationship isn't always the same there. I mean, I guess hypothetically, you could you could translate Yehoshua as he saves Yah, 
but um, or even Isaiah as he saves Yah, but that seems a bit um, unlikely in the in the context of the Tanakh. No. But <laughs> right. right, so this whole discussion, it's great. Yeah. So like. I guess the one message I have to the people listening today is you don't have to get the answer, but just the discussion is it, it's the Tanakh has a lot of fruitful puns in them. There's, there's a lot there that you can glean if you know what to look for. I want to stop you there because that's a profound concept that I've found that is a given to Jews and to many non-Jews, it's an alien concept. In other words, the, the Jewish approach is to say, you not, not, not everyone's identical, but by and large, I think the Jewish approach is to say that the question could be more important than the answer, that there might be um, a thousand answers and we don't know which one is correct. But right. if you don't even know what the question is, you can't even you can't even look for the answer. And so defining the questions are are uh, are in a sense more important than what the specific answer is, because I get a lot of people who will say to me, just give me the answer to me. I don't want to hear all this whole discussion of these four options. Just tell me the answer. Well, I don't have a crystal ball, and I'm not I'm neither the prophet nor the son of a prophet. I might be the son of a rabbi, but I'm not the son of a prophet. And and so I don't know what the answer is. I know there's three possibilities or eight possibilities, or maybe there's one possibility, but f- knowing what the question is, that at least puts you on the path where you can try to figure out the answer for yourself. If you don't even know what the question is, then um, you know, well, then you, you don't even you, do, you can't even begin. So Right. There, there's a famous commentary, uh, a very voluminous commentary by a man named Abarbanel, and he puts out dozens of questions on every section of, of the Bible that he discusses. It's just boom, boom, boom. He gives you all these questions, and and it's quite clear from Abarbanel's perspective the questions are more important than the answers. So, but yeah. he tries to give an answer too. <laughs> of course, he gives an answer too, and he gives a discussion. But the, right, but the question in some respects is more there. important. And, and, and that's a, one of the things I want to bring for people that, that you know, you, you, could, you could come in and, I mean, look, you could learn Hebrew all, all over the place, right? There's a lot of different sources to learn Hebrew. One of the things that I love about the opportunity for people to study Hebrew with you as a rabbi and a doctor, you know, having a PhD, is you bring this Jewish approach to it, which is, you didn't even say it as, as, as a, you weren't suggesting it, it was a given that, right. that, um, that you know, the that the question is is more important than the answer and but that's not a given for many people and i, and I think that itself uh, conveys so much value that people can benefit from nice so how's about i tell you um what super broiler suggested on reddit for our super second reason to boiler su- okay that's somebody's name okay super yes yeah, su- on somebody's name okay. so uh, um so what i'd like to do is just show some 145 here okay psalm 145 which uh what we'll look at here we have it in the, for those who are watching on on a screen what we have on the left hand side is the hebrew and on the right hand side is the king james and so, what bible program are you using here i'm using accordance bible my, what, what my friend keith calls the tap tap this is the one i use yes yeah of course i love it um if you join if you come to our institute we have our own special uh um discount with accordance for really? anything you buy yeah okay. so we, we're like accordance people but a lot of people do logos and and what was it um Bi- bible uh, works of love and as they say bible right? works may rest, bible may works rest, of, uh, may rest in peace <laughs> Bless right, right. so so um what we have here it starts with hilala david uh, a praise a song of praise of david and then what we have is just the entire psalm and we could read through the whole thing and when you read through the english you kind of I'm not going to read it for you, but it's basically a lot of praise for God, but there's no real order to it. No real order to it. And what Super Brother pointed out is that in the Tanakh, at least 10, between 10 and 20 times, we have these passages that are all ordered according to the al- alphabet, the alphabet. And for example, let me look here. What we have here is. Um, can, can I explain what I think you mean by there's no order to it? What, 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 I, what yes. I think you want to say is you have these individual verses, each of which is unconnected to the next verse, right? right? They're so individual. I will, I will, I, they're, in, they're, they're standalone sentences, which is unusual. Um, normally, you have a, a passage, and verse two is a continuation of verse one, and verse three is a continuation right. of verse two. And here it's, um, I could read verse two, and it has nothing to do with verse three, except I mean, it's a common theme, right? right? Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. 
Verse 3, great is the Lord and great to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Right. Well, what and, is, and, how, verse 3 doesn't follow from verse 2. Right. To be fair, there are a lot of psalms that are just lovely praised, but True. a lot of them are also yeah. ordered, and the order only comes in the Hebrew. So what I, while you were just speaking, I highlighted the first letter yeah. of each verse, and, and what we have is the Aleph, the Bet, the Gimel, the Dalit, mm -hmm. so this is the A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And so what basically in the Tanakh, the, it often presents itself as having this kind of literary characteristic. And a lot of times you could say, oh, it's, it's OK. It's in the English that we forgot about it. So who, care, who cares? You know, why do I need to know that this is the ABCs? Um, a lot of times these are pretty mind blowing. For, for example, um, most of us consider Psalm 9 and 10. We consider it to be two Psalms. Right. Mm. But when you look at the acrostic, it actually goes from nine through ten. Wait, so, so tell people what, a, what an acrostic is. An acrostic, an acrostic is this idea of having a text ordered according to the alphabet. So, um, you know, if you give me one I, second. I, I would even define it a little bit differently. I would say that that there is a um, I'm going to use a fancy word. There's a meta text here. In other words, we have the, the words themselves and, and what they mean. But we also have a message that's being conveyed by the initial letters uh, spread out across the verses in this case, right? So we, so we have Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He spelled out in the, in the psalm, uh, which is a second layer of meaning that you wouldn't get from just reading it in the, um, in the English. Right, and the thing is, is that, you know, why, why was the psalm written this way? Why, yeah. why are there so many of these in Tanakh? And actually, if you know the Hebrew, you can actually memorize them pretty easily. Right. right, so, it, this so it's, verse, it's a memorization device, right? Right. A every song, child in ancient Israel knew the Aleph Bet, and and he might not have remember what verse came next, but he remember, oh, it's the one that starts with Bet, and after that's the one that starts with Gimel. So it's a exactly. memory, memory device, exactly. Exactly. This is the 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 past, Psalm one forty five is part of the Ashrei said at least two times a day, um, and so you know it by heart. You know, Ritzon is the Reish, Shomer is the Shin, and then every Shabbat. Every Friday night dinner, me and my family, we read, mm -hmm. we sing this out loud from Proverbs 31. And it's another acrostic. Eshet Chayel Miyimsa. Who can find the virtuous woman? And mm -hmm. Eshet Chayel. You know, when, when, I, when I got in, engaged, I, I said, I finally find, found my Eshet Chayel. And there were people on Facebook who thought that my uh, fiance's name was, last name was Chayel. And her first name was Eshet. Uh, they didn't realize I was referring to Proverbs 31. Yeah, percent. so that was the Hebrew of saying Eshet Chayel is like a woman of valor praise, or the virtuous woman, woman or something. Yeah, a, a woman who who is to be praised. And then it goes on with the Aleph is the first verse and then the Bet Batach. So if I ever get lost, I'm singing, you know, we have wine in mm -hmm. my hands, you know, it's uh -huh. like if you ever get like a little lost, like, oh, Dalit, Darshat Semer of Yeah, and, and I think it's important to remember that in ancient times, not everybody had books. And so right, maybe you'd remember it, it yet. Yeah. So they so it's very important for them to remember things by heart. And and so so I think that kind of gives us a glimpse that this is any of these acrostic uh, psalms or, or lamentations, or in this case, uh, the song of the valor valorous women was probably something that that was intended for the common man to um, to to memorize. Right. And so once you know the Hebrew and you can look for these things, you can see some very interesting um, studies. So, for example, what I want to point out to you is that in in the acrostic, which we first mentioned, Psalm 145, which every verse starts with the letter, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, going through the whole thing, um, you get one of these interesting things in your Bibles. So maybe for everyone listening today, maybe, you know, obviously, if you're on the road, don't don't do this now, but um, check. No, your... pull over to the side of the road as long as it's safe right now. And <laughs> check, <kidding>. check <laughs> Psalm 145, 13. Uh -huh. um, so because a lot of the translations, for example, I have here the NRSV, add a verse into the Bible. This is a verse that doesn't appear, for example, in the King James. So let's do the King James. Nehemiah, could you kindly do um, verse 13 in the King James? Um, so the King James 40, uh, 145, 13 yeah. says, Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. All right. And so let's, if you could, one more one more reading is if you could do it now in the NRSV, the New Revised so the NRSV Version. NRSV begins the 
same. Your kingdom is everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Then it continues in the same verse. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. Right. This is a new verse in the Bible that's not in the King James. It's not in the Hebrew. So where did this come mm. from? Why is the NRSV and others adding this verse? So without checking, I'm going to assume it comes from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Tanakh. It's is actually that... going to be, I don't know if it's Septuagint, but it's definitely in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, um, so, so the Septuagint does have it. Right. Because the idea, Nehemia, is that every single verse mm -hmm. in this psalm begins with the letter of the alphabet, but there's no letter mm -hmm. nun, which for us would be the N. There's no so, N verse. So it's, it's missing a letter. Okay. It's missing a letter. And because it's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, because it's in the Septuagint, the NRSV editors felt strong enough that this could be added to our Bibles. Right. So that you now have in this verse. Well, and, and it, they would have said restored to our Bibles, but okay. Well, they would have said restored. Yeah. And yeah. so that's a decision or at least presented. You know, it's 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 a tough call what to do. But compared to the King James, it was definitely added. No questions. But compared to the okay. Hebrew of the Masoretic text, it was added. No questions. Right. Right. Well, so this so, is OK. Here, So it's Ne'aman Elohim. This is in the. All right, you're going to read it. OK. I don't want, I'm gonna cut. All right. Go ahead. No, I don't have it in front of me. But uh, OK. So I have it, a, a, a module in accordance uh, where it has the Hebrew. And, and this is very interesting. So it's 11Q5, uh, uh, 11th cave at Qumran, uh, manuscript number five. It says Boch. And then it has Yud Hey Vav Hey. In Paleo Hebrew, I love that. Uboch Shemo Leolam Ba'ed. Blessed is uh, Yud Hey Vav Hey, and blessed is his name forever. So here's the Hebrew of the of the of what's called the Masoretic text, which has the Mem and the Samach. And in the between, there's no Nun. And then here you have the New Revised Standard Version. And the extra verse I read is here. The Lord is faithful in all his words. Oh, and this is very cool. So I can I can do this thing where I highlight the word in accordance, faithful. And you see nothing nothing shows up in, in the in, in our text. Bibles. Right. Right. But it shows up here. In the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it does tag it. Ne'eman Elohim bitbarav v'chasid b'chol ma'asav. So faithful is God in his uh, deeds and his actions or his words. And he is chassid, he is chesed, he is, he is uh, 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 faithfulness or loving kindness, b'chor ma'asav in all of his deeds, all his actions. What's right. interesting to me on another level is that, so that here's the Greek, the Greek has pistos kurios and tois logois, logois atu, which is the same thing, except it has, instead of Elohim, it has right. kur, kurios, which is a translation of Azar Adonai or Yudhebabhe. Exactly. Uh, and not Elohim. So that so so here we have the missing verse you could say restored um from, from the Masoretic text, uh, meaning missing the Masoretic text restored in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but then we have a textual variant between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Greek, which is also very right. interesting. And then and then people to be fair, they say, Well, maybe this wasn't even the missing verse because it's actually a piecemeal from different parts of the psalm. So, uh, so what, what, so this is, this is why I'm always hesitant to say we've restored the original. So, I like to say yeah. we, 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 we are restoring the Dead Sea Scrolls version. You know, I, I so, like that. Right. So, so there, there, there's this, so this is a, a classic problem in textual criticism. The classic problem is the principle of um, difficilio lectio, which is, is a fancy way of saying if it sounds too good to be true, maybe it's too good to be true. Right, so, so you have a difficult text. The difficult text is it jumps from mem to nun. That sounds that sounds like something's wrong, right. and so and so maybe it's because a verse is missing. And then the other possibility is uh, whether that verse was missing or not. People two thousand years ago had, had the same question. They said we're missing a verse. Right. Let's make one up to fill in the, in the gap. Right, so we don't right. know. We right. don't know if if they filled in the gap based on taking pieces from other parts of the verse, like you said. Or if this is the original, right? It could go both ways. Right. So um, everybody, everybody yeah. should check in their Bibles, uh, Psalm 145, verse 13, mm -hmm. and see if they have that that half verse that's added, the Lord is yeah. faithful in all his words. Right. And in the Septuagint, they call it verse 13a. Right. Or, and yeah. so so just this whole idea is that if you know the Hebrew, you know the idea of an acrostic, an A, B, C, D, E, F, G verse and uh, psalm and once you know that you can actually look for 
cool things like the missing verse here in right. Psalm 145, verse 13. Did you follow the story of where acrostics showed up in, in, uh, in mainstream American culture last year? No, um, tell me, Nehemiah. So, so it was this great incident where this, um, let's see, it was a, I Googled it here just to remind myself. It was, um, I couldn't remember this guy's name. Representative Paul A. Gosser of Arizona put out a series of uh, like 20 or 30 tweets. And someone noticed that if you took the first letter of each of these tweets and put them together, it spelled out the sentence, Epstein didn't kill himself. Oh, because of that. Yes. Now, now, does he believe Epstein didn't kill himself? Right. I don't know if he does or doesn't, but he, he had hoped that someone would notice this and it would get national press. And it not only got national press, it got international press. Some senator that nobody can, or I guess he's a House of Representatives from you know, Arizona, who outside of Arizona, no one's heard of this guy. He's not in the national attention. He intentionally did this so that people would hear his message by putting out something controversial. And then he put out another single tweet where the first letter is spelled out Area 51. Uh, <laughs> and it said, all the tweets pertain to today's hearing. Rest assured they're substantive. Every one of them, all of them, five were brilliant. One was okay. And he put it out where it spelled out Area 51. And why did he do that? Because he wanted people to pay attention to his tweets. And uh, my takeaway from this is there's obviously somebody Jewish who knows Hebrew on his staff. Because where does anybody in, in uh, Western culture know about an acrostic, right? There, there must have been someone on his staff who said, I have an idea. And I'm sure he said, I know who, what you want to put in my tweets, well, but, it, but it worked. It got him international uh, attention yeah, and like, for his you know, message. I don't, know the, I don't know the history of English acrostics, but the idea is uh, that person, you're going to pay more attention, right? No, so, it, so, it, so it, it's a distinctively, now it may exist in other cultures and languages, but it actually, as far as I know, Hebrew uh, invented this idea of acrostics. And look at the Tanakh, we have very basic acrostics where it's Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. As you well know, in the Middle Ages, we have acrostics where somebody wrote a whole poem that spelled out their name. Right. Or, another, or another thing they did is in some manuscripts um, that have nothing to do with the Tanakh or anything. It will be a manuscript of a commentary of the, uh, of the Talmud or something. And then they, uh, they would put like a little symbol. Uh, it wasn't necessarily the first letter of, of each um, sentence, but they put a little symbol and another symbol and another symbol until it spelled out the name of the scribe. And they do right. that like on a single page where you'd find it, right? They wanted people to find it. And these are very helpful for memorization. Yeah. They're yeah. very helpful. Um, so, yes, this is something that, that in the Hebrew, or if you're careful on the internet with tweets, you can find also. But this, the idea is that this is something that is completely lost in the translation. Um, right. You know, there's no, even if even if the translator says, oh, by the way, this is an acrostic, it doesn't and, really yeah. mean anything. And, and they do that. For example, in, in a lot of the translations of Psalm 119, where you have the entire alphabet spelled out, eight entire times. alphabet, eight times, eight aleps, eight bets, eight gimels. And you ask yourself, the, long, the longest chapter. What, what, the why does verse three, what does verse three have to do with verse four? Nothing except they both start with aleph, right? right. Um, so that's actually important to know. It gives you some insight into what you're reading. Um, so so you have that, but but also, uh, so it was for memorization for sure. And and so, so the tr many translations have that. It'll say aleph. And then in verse nine, it'll say bet. And in verse, you know, whatever the next one, it'll say gimel. Um, and some people, you know, they wouldn't even know what that is. Or if you explain it to them, okay. But it doesn't help them memorize it, which is what the purpose was in ancient Israel. What's, what's beautiful to me is it, is it gives us an idea of not just what the text means, but in a, some respect, how it was consumed, which we don't right. always know. Like it gives like us the what the... Yeah, yep. the, the Zitzimleben, the, what they call the, yeah, the context they, in which this text was used. Right. You know, I love that. None of the Israelites had a Bible in their house. This yeah. was, you, they heard it and they needed to, to walk with it and keep it. And so an acrostic yeah. is a good way to do that. Right. It's so rare a Bible in ancient Israel, or the Torah even, let's say, that it's a commandment for the king to write for himself a copy. Otherwise, he won't have one. Right. So. Um, all right. Should we go on to what House Dorf Dim suggested as a, one of the great things about Hebrew that is lost in translation? House Dorf. Oh, that's somebody's name on um, on, on, Reddit. on Reddit. Okay. Let's do one more from Reddit, and then I'm going to ask to shift gears and maybe save the rest. Uh, yeah. Save the rest for the bonus episode. 
What's is there yeah. one more that's just crucial that this, you want to get for for the public episode? Okay, so this is the last one from the Reddit that I actually found to okay. be really, really special. Beautiful. Um, and but then in the bonus episode, we're gonna share some really special stuff, but maybe not from Reddit. All right. Right, and so um, it's these. There are a lot of words in Hebrew that have two meanings, mm -hmm. and it depends on each context how you want to translate them. Mm -hmm. And one of the more obvious ones is the word El or Elohim. Mm -hmm. El could mean God, Elohim could mean gods, or it could just mean the God, meaning the God yeah. of Israel, the God of the world. Or it could even mean judges in one passage, right? I mean, or in a number of passages. Right. Um, yes, it could mean, yeah, that's the kind. Like, exactly like when they talk the about drilling the guy's ear, it tell, says to bring him to the Elohim. That seems that that's the judges. Right. And Aaron, it says, Aharon, he says, you are going to be um, Moshe's, Moses' speaker, but he's going to be your Elohim, your God, your, right. your power. So um, maybe their so, Elohim is meant metaphorically, but, but when it says, you know, you will do as the Elohim convict, and it's Yashi'un, plural, there it obviously doesn't refer to, to God with a capital G, but to presumably judges or something like that. Right. Um, so let me do, wait one second. Here we go. So um, let me make this a little bigger. Um, let me change this to JPS one second. And we can edit this out. Now I want people to see how accordance works. This is great. All right. So here we are. So what I'm showing you is Psalm 29.1 in the Hebrew and in the King James and in the, jo in the Jewish Publication Society. Three, two translations and one text. So it says, Mizmor le David, a Mizmor, a Psalm of David, Havula the Bnei Elim. Give to God the sons of the Elim. Give to God the glory and the strength. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what we have here is this word Elim, the Bene Elim, the sons mm -hmm. of Elim. And so what does that mean? So let's take a look at these two translations. So Nehemiah, yeah. can you take, for example, the King James here? I'm uh, just reading on your screen. It says, uh, give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. So, so Elim here, Ben Elim is translated as mighty ones. Right. Okay. And, and let's do the Jewish Publication Society. Ascribe to the Lord, O oh, divine beings. Right. So it's divine beings. Okay. Right. And, and so we, basically yeah. words like El and Elohim in each context, and they could also mean foreign gods. Does it mean foreign God, the God, or does it mean just like some strength, some mighty person? And these can mean different things. And each time you read this in your English, you're like, okay not noticing that the translator made a big decision. They made mm -hmm. a big decision, okay? Um, let's also look at Genesis 3, 5 here for the same concept. Mm -hmm. All right. So what we're basically in this story here, we're in the story of Genesis and the snake is trying to convince Chava, Eve, he's trying to convince her to eat the fruit and he says, for, he'll just start in the English, for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, that your eyes will be opened. And y'all shall be Kelohim. Tell us like, why you said y'all. I love the um, y'all. Well, well, there's, there's a, um, well, for Southerners out there, you should know that y'all is very biblical because there's a difference between you, masculine, you, feminine, and y'all, masculine, and y'all, feminine. Right? So, now, so now I'm going to educate you on Southern English because I live in Texas now. Yep. And in Texas, there's a distinction between y'all and all y'all. Y'all is singular, although it can be used to refer to two. And all y'all is plural. So, and it may differ in different parts of the South. But basically, you're trying to show there's a difference between singular you and plural you. And pietem is you, plural, all y'all will, right. be will become Elohim or like Elohim. Right. And so what that basically means is that all y'all are going to become like Elohim, which we just saw could either mean God, uh -huh. it can mean God with a capital G, God with a small G, like the God of Moab, the God mm -hmm. of the gods of, of Greece, right? Mm -hmm. And it could also mean just a mighty person. And so what is the snake saying? Are You are becoming like Elohim, okay? So why don't we take a look? Mm -hmm. In this case, I want to show you the difference between the King James and the New King James. Okay? Oh, wow. Which are supposed to be identical. 
except it, one except is supposed to have more modern language, more modern but in language. fact, but in fact, they're not identical even in content. Right. And so what? Wow. So Nehemiah, can you kindly just read for me um, the King yeah. James this this last phrase here? So uh, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Right. You shall be as gods. So Elohim means gods. Right. And mm -hmm. you read that, you're like, okay, fine. Let's read the New King James. You will be like God, capital G, knowing good and evil. Right. And wow. so if you don't know, if you don't know Hebrew, you don't know that every time the name God is mentioned or gods is mentioned, the translator is doing their best to try and figure this out, this ambiguity. Is it gods or is it the God? Right? Yeah. So that's here, amazing. according to the King James, that the Adam and Eve are going to be like these gods that kind of exist around God, what we might think of as angels or something like that, right? Um, not necessarily a, a direct equation, but that idea. No, no, but according to New King James, it's no, you're going to be like God himself. So there's two ways of looking at that, David. When yeah. you say like angels, meaning what we would call angels. So one is to, is, is to diminish what, what Genesis 3.5 means by the meaning of God. Right. Or gods and to say, well, right. no, 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 it's not God. They understood, right. uh, uh, or they, let's say the ancient Israelites who heard this understood he doesn't mean Elohim capital G, means Elohim small g, gods, and small g gods is angels like in the book of Job, uh, right. and then I maybe we... some other places. Uh, the other way of looking at it is yeah. I, want, I once had a professor at Hebrew University who said Judaism isn't monotheistic. Judaism right. has many deities. Just we take this pill that we swallow that makes right. us feel good. And that pill is to say, oh, no, we just have angels. But, mi, and, kamocha, and, and, mi kamocha be'elim Adonai. Who, who is like you among, okay, let's just hold that thought. Right. Yeah. And, here, and here's, because that's actually something even a little bit different. Um, although maybe not. So here, here was his argument. He said, you know, and, and, I don't, and here he was talking about Judaism in the broadest sense. Meaning if you go to a Kabbalist, 700 years ago at um who was formulating certain prayers and he's praying to angels for them to intercede on god's behalf what difference is there between an angel and god with a small g right meaning th that form of judaism maybe does have many gods except right. it, it it convinces itself it doesn't by calling those gods angels but from right. an outside purely uh, objective perspective that, that maybe is polytheistic. There's one God who's most powerful, and there's these little gods who you interact right. with. People like people. to throw around the word monolatry. Yeah. Monolatry. Right. So tell us what monolatry is. But it's not even monolatry. They're praying to the lower, <laughs> to these angels, right? Well, so the monolatry, so it means that there's that there's lots of gods, but God is the greatest God. And that comes from reading the Tanakh, the, the, the Bible in Hebrew, when you see these ambiguities here. Well, my so understanding of monolatry is there's many gods, but you only worship one of them. Right. right. In other There's words, one, you, you say, yeah, Kam you, you say Kamosh is a God and Baal is a God, but I'm not supposed to worship Kamosh or Baal. I'm only supposed to worship right. Yudhe But Whereas, it's not like, it's not like it, worship. It's not like sports where you like have your team, even if they're bad. The idea is that you have the best God, right? That's for why sure. You're for sure. Right. But in medieval Judaism, and, and let's say certain forms of Kabbalah, at the very least, you have people who are praying to different powers um, that aren't the infinite God, the Insof. And they'll say, oh, no, those are just emanations from God. Um, I've argued that medieval Kabbalah, specifically the Zohar, isn't uh, monotheistic. But, uh, it, it, you know, in Christianity, sometimes they'll talk about the triune deity. And medieval um, or Zohar Kabbalah at least had a decaun deity. And there's actually a statement, 10, 10 decaun, 10 that are one. There's actually an explicit statement in the Zohar that says the one is 10 and the 10 are one. Referring to the spirit. Maybe that's way off topic, but you really have a good point here. So go right. back to Mika Mocha by Elohim uh, Go back. That's actually a much more powerful statement um, or example in a way. Um, yeah, Exodus so, 15 11. So it's in the Song of the Sea. It goes back uh, ba based on the internal biblical chronology, at least. If you take it at base val face value, this was written before the Ten Commandments. Right. right? It, or, it takes place before the Ten Commandments. Who is like you among the Elim, O Yudhivabe? So who are these Elim? Who are these gods? Right. So, so who are these yeah. Elim? Why don't we just do, there's a cool thing on Accordance called Text yeah. Browser, uh -huh. where you can see every text that you have uh -huh. all at once. I don't think okay. I've ever used this feature. 
Um, and so mm -hmm. what we can see is, so the question is, Mika Mocha Be'elim Adonai, who is like you, who is like you amongst the gods, O Lord, right? So here we have gods. Let's see, we have gods, gods, gods. The right, celestials so the, and the JPS. <laughs> right, the, right, so the, the, when you see this in your when you see this in your English, you say among the celestials, you're like, okay, I'm just reading the English. But like you, when you see it in the Hebrew, you're like, oh. Wait, mouse over the D. What's in the D? It's going to be the note that tells us. Others, Others mighty. mighty. Who is like you among the mighty? They still the obvious one of gods, right? right. They left out. Right. Um, so, so this is a theologically correct translation. Right. So that was one case, but really these happen on every page. Every single translation yeah. is making decisions like this where right. they have where the words could have one of two meanings. Um, I maybe we don't have to go into it exactly for the sake of time, but I'll just point out another one that that people I want you to say that for the bonus episode and I, and I want to end with this statement I think or this have you talk about this idea Here's what I love about knowing Hebrew myself and why I think people should learn Hebrew. You made the statement that on every page, the translator is making this decision for you. And the power of being able to know Hebrew yourself and read it yourself is I still have to make the decision, but I'm making the decision myself based on information where I can weigh the pros and cons of, you know, of, of which, you know, how do I know, right? I'm, I'm doing the best I can instead of just blindly following what somebody else says. Or the other thing that people do is they'll take the 20 translations and they'll go with the one they like the best, but then it's not based on any That's actual not, information. Right. It it's, maybe happen. it's wrong. How do you know? You're just right. blindly following what somebody else says. That's why I think it's so important to learn Hebrew. Um, I mean, this is why I studied Hebrew. Um, I went to, why I went to Hebrew University and moved to Israel was that growing up, I would read the Bible. I could read the Torah. And I was told, well, yeah, you can translate these verses, but you don't know enough. You don't know what your great grandfather, this great rabbi knew. And you don't know what these other ancestors you had knew. Um, how, why do you think you're right? And, and all these other rabbis are wrong uh, because they have the power of the translation. Even if you can translate a specific verse, you don't know uh, as much as they knew. So I made the decision. I need to know as much as they knew and more. And that's why I went and studied uh, biblical Hebrew did my master's in biblical Hebrew at Hebrew University and continue to study the Bible every day so that I could know. And, and look, one of the things I discovered is that I there were things I didn't know. I didn't know how much I didn't know until I started to actually know things. Exactly. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, right. People can Google Dunning-Kruger effect. I lived on Mount Stupid for many years. Um, right. And then, 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 you know, and then I came into the, I forget what it's called, like the Valley of, of Knowledge or something like that where you realize, wow, there is a lot I don't know, but at least I know what I don't know, yeah. right? And, and I know how to find it out, or if it can't be found out, I know that too. So, th so right. this is to me, this to me is the power of being, re being able to read the language yourself. You cut out the intermediary and you're able to interact with God's word, with the ancient Hebrew text directly for yourself. Yes. And, and maybe as a last thing, I'd say kind of a yeah. segue is yeah. Nehemiah, you, what you're talking about is learning Hebrew is that yeah. for those who are watching on the screen, yeah, um, I just have all the, the, uh, the information for our Hebrew summer course. And mm -hmm. this is the, we're recording this in 2021 at, towards the end of the pandemic. And um, we're doing, I'm teaching this on zoom in the summer, but it's not only then if, if, if you're re listening to this, years down the road, also come back and just try and get a course if you're interested and study all that biblical text in Hebrew. So it's biblicalculture.org and you can find him on YouTube, Biblical Culture, and you do all kinds of teachings and studies and you have all kinds of courses where people can take courses in, um, in, in the Bible and the Old and the Tanakh, it's called, it's called the Old Testament. You actually have courses taught by uh, I think it was a course taught about the New Testament as well. Yeah, right? we, have, we have New Testament scholars yeah. who, who do anything ranging from yeah. Philippians to wow. to just basic gospel. Um, and those aren't necessarily taught by Orthodox Jews. That Those are taught by people come from a Christian perspective, but also an academic perspective, right? Yeah, it's really, the, the truth is, I often tell my Jewish friends that Christianity, uh, early Christian texts are fascinating to read. Mm -hmm. Just like any early Jewish text, there's there's mm -hmm. so much interpretation there. There's so much rich new ideas there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's open to anyone and everyone. That's no questions. Beautiful. Excellent. David, would you end with a prayer? I love ending programs with a prayer when we can. Yeah. 
Yes, I would love to. And we mentioned Psalm 145 a lot mm. in our discussion. Yes. That was the acrostic, the Alf, Aleph, Bet, A, B, C, D Psalm. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that, that I would try and pick a verse from that Psalm that was related to the fascinating mm. time we find ourselves in. We're yeah. coming to the end of a pandemic. The world is healing. And so I thought in that Psalm, verse number nine, we have Tov Adonai Lakol, Rachamav Al Kol Maasav. God is good to all, and his mercy is on all his creation, on all his works. So this idea of having mercy and healing a world that has just been through a lot. And so that's whether our readers have themselves gotten sick or know someone who's gotten sick, or even if they didn't, and it's just been really tough with all the new restrictions and whatnot. It's just uh, some mercy is very much um, looked for and, and hoped for. Amen. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiasWall.com.